Welcome to Summer Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the third Sunday after Epiphany, which falls on January 24th, 2021, are these. Jonah 3, 1 through 5 and verse 10. Psalm 62, 5 through 12. The second reading is 1 Corinthians 7, 29 through 31. And from the gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. So I, I think one of the challenges with with the gospel text I, that that preachers are going to uh, think about is the fact that this is one of four times that like roughly this opening occurs <laughs> within the space of a pretty short time uh, because we had, well, we had one through eight for Advent, uh, then four through 11 for the baptism of our Lord. Uh, here we have one 14 through 20 for uh, third Sunday after Epiphany and the first Sunday of Lent is nine through 15. So uh, we're, we're getting a lot of exposure to these, these first uh, verses in Mark. And so it, I, I think maybe one, one uh, beginning point for a preacher is to, is, is to reflect on what have they said so far uh, with, these particular, with these particular verses. We don't have the baptism here, but uh, you, you, know, you, can't really, you can't really go forward without going backward, obviously. And so just to start and say, what have I said about, what have I said about these opening verses of Mark so far? What difference does that make for uh, moving into uh, these particular verses, 14 and 15 are so critical uh, for the gospel of Mark as Jesus' first public words and uh, how, he, how he's orienting uh, his, his ministry, that the kingdom of God has come near uh, and um, believe in this gospel, this good news that God is here. Uh, and then also to think about, okay, we're in epiphany. So how does that change uh, our perspective on, on this particular passage. And of course, the, the focus here is on the calling of the disciples. So that that's, doesn't necessarily offer a homiletical point, but it's just to, uh, as, you're, as preachers are doing their preparation for this passage, just to kind of um, put that all into perspective and say, yeah, what, what is it in that larger framework? What am I going to focus on this time? I'd like us to take a, just, just a while in verse 15. Um, I take the way I read the narrative of Mark lately, I take verse 15 as the kind of keynote theme verse for the whole gospel, at least for maybe the first eight chapters. Um, so just play with that, even if you don't agree necessarily, um, and, uh, because I'm gonna kind of press that over the next few weeks. Um, but let's talk about what each of those phrases or words means a little bit. Um, because especially I think the one that is most probably misunderstood is the word repent uh, in the, so let's, but start, what, what does it mean the time is fulfilled? Is it just simply, oh, the time for the Messiah is here or in Mark's narrative, um, is it more? And I asked that as a question to which I don't know the answer. So I'm hoping that um, you guys will uh, help me out. I wrote the Dear Working Preacher article for this week, um, and we're recording this before you've all seen it, so I'm not holding that against you, but I, I spend some time there reflecting on time and the notion of time as part of our callings, as part of the first disciples' callings, and part of Jesus' own calling. He has a clear sense of, of what time it is, and I think one of the things that's happening here is he's saying enough is enough, and that's partly in response to the arrest of John. Uh, it's partly in response to the testing in the wilderness that he's undergone. It's that he's he's had a chance to survey the society around him, uh, and he knows that he's got to do something, that he has a calling to live out, and that's part of it. It's enough. I'm done being silent. Or I'm done being passive. It's time to do something. And so he's calling these friends now into action as well in, in what follows. It's not all that it means. Uh, I think that's part of what it means in this context. But it's not, I, I'm assuming you're not then making a, a link to some sort of call to action now out of that because what Christ's, the reality Christ brings about is uh, so different than that sort of misunderstanding. So what does it mean for him to be 
as the Christ um, of God, enough is enough and the time is, is um, fulfilled. Well, I think it is a call to action for, for him and for his followers. Uh, and part of that is, I think, what we will see that his public ministry will now be a demonstration of this new kingdom of God, of a new way of, of being in the world. Pardon the hammering in the background. Uh, that's, and we'll see that just a little bit in Epiphany. We get just three passages to really characterize the ministry, the public ministry of Jesus with this, with an exorcism and with a healing, but all of those are a kind of new eschatological reality, right? A kind of, of turning of the page into a new chapter in, in, uh, in God's work in the world, the defeat of the demonic, a defeat of the forces that bring about death, uh, which he'll continue to live out and what eventually will get him killed. And so that will be part of it. But preachers have three weeks to really set the stage for that that sense of urgency, that sense of, again, kind of eschatological now, this is the moment now to glimpse something new, to live into something new and to see God's power on display in brand new ways. Let me just flag really quickly. We'll see some more of that in 1 Corinthians 7, which I hope we can talk about too, in terms of what does this kind of readiness have to look like, but well, I think part of uh, part of the answer to the time is uh, fulfilled is has to do with how you interpret repent, and that's uh, that's really the key. I, I mean, that's one of the keys, I think. Uh, the CEB, uh, Common English Bible, which is the standard translation for the Methodist Church, uh, translates this: mm -hmm. "Now is the time. Uh, now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom." Uh, change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. And so, so making that connection or uh, uh, Gary Charles translates this, turn around and take a hold of something better than what you have now. And so that, that understanding of repentance as, as what is going to be your perspective, uh, are you, are you, do you see that the kingdom is now? Um, is here, and uh, and that and the time is now to see that 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 the kingdom is present, and so I think I think that becomes a, a, an important interpretational link is to say the 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 time was fulfilled, but for what? Uh, it's to see that a new kingdom is present, and 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 the verb repent is going to be used again. Uh, when Jesus sends out the 12 in chapter six uh, and says, uh, and, and so that, that it is that sort of uh, sense of sending or how is it that they are going to go out and say the kingdom of God is here as well. And so uh, making that connection, I think is important. I appreciate that, and uh, the leaning into, as um, the Methodist who reads CEB, um, uh, leaning into the, the good news portion, which is also uh, in 14, uh, that sometimes when we use, when we have used the word repent, it's been used as a condemnation, and it's been used in a negative sense, and uh, I, I kind of uh, am hearing Matt this sort of uh, your statement enough is enough is to be able to say um, not enough is enough and you're doomed and you're bad and you need to change but enough of this bad is enough and let's point as you're saying Caroline let's point to the presence of God that is among us the peace of God that is is evident because of the presence of God and the promise of God that this is enough. And finally, what is better is, um, is I, I want to say just around the corner because I want this, I, I want, I, I think more than ever, our listeners need to recognize that even as we acknowledge God's presence, it's not going to be an instantaneous um, okay, I see it, I name it, and it is. We're still on the journey, just as the, as the disciples were still on the journey. And throughout this narrative, they're not going to get it perfectly. Uh, and, and so how do we proclaim this presence um, as promise, as a glimpse or evidence of peace, but not get disappointed because it's not 
completely fulfilled. And, and that's why I like the, um, the translation of, of, uh, of near, um, uh, uh, of, of among us. As I think, as, as I'm reflecting on what you guys are all saying, uh, um, I think the sense for me is that the time of God's decisive action in history, um, had the, the, the you know, Matt mentioned the eschatological or Carolyn, I can't remember, um, that the inbreaking of God's preferred future for the world is uh, now happening in Jesus. And the word repent, metanoia, um, it's often mistaken. Uh, people often mistakenly equate it with the Hebrew word shuv. Shuv is to turn around. Metanoia is to be of a new mind or a new heart, which is why CEB says change your hearts. Mm -hmm. um, but I like this also the sense of mind, which is, you know, wrap your mind around this new reality. Mm -hmm. um, is how I like to think of that word. Um, you know, have your mind blown by what God is doing in Jesus, and wrap your mind around it, and and um, and then believe in the good news. Uh, a different, a different reality is breaking into the world than the reality of you know law and sin and death and hate, uh, which has been the norm, and. Um, that's what the working preacher's job is to do, is to proclaim that different reality. Yeah, I think that's, uh, those are important points, Rolf. And I, you know, a couple of the things that are important with that, one is that both repent and believe in the gospel are uh, plural imperatives. And so it, it's uh, that believing in, believing in the gospel or, or trusting, I, I, do, I do kind of like that translation here of trusting in the gospel. That is trusting, as you said, uh, Rolf, that this, this new order is present. Uh, and, but this is a group effort. Uh, this is not, and that, that also helps with a little bit with the corrective of repentance, which tends to get so individualized. Uh, as some sort of, you know, some sort of confession or uh, admittance of sins. And that, you know, that change of perspective or change, wrap, I love that, wrap your, wrap your mind around or try to wrap your mind around a different, a different, a new order that's present. Uh, but we, but we do this, we do this together. We do this as a group. Uh, we do this as in community with one another. And, uh, and so, um, and we go, we go with that community, we lean into uh, that reality together. And like you said, Rolf, not, or Joy, not maybe seeing it right away, but, uh, and, and the question is, what will you see? Uh, but, uh, but that, but we do that in, in this community. So I think that's another, another, another important piece of this, um, of these verses. Which pulls it straight into the calling of uh, uh, Simon and Andrew and this sense of that their task will be to bring others along. Um, uh, there's a statement um, um, that our salvation is for the, 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 the salvation of the community. And we've lost that, as you've already referenced, that we've made repentance this kind of individual confession, as opposed to what Jesus is doing right here, which is what God was doing in the beginning, forming a community with whom the presence of God is so evident that the promise of God's peace is glimpsed even in the midst of chaos. And that's where 612 is, you know, to make that connection here uh, with 612 that, uh, so they went out, this is the sending of the mission of the 12. So, you know, talking about here, here they're being called and what is their mission going to, what, what is it going to be and what is it going to look like in 612. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. And so, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that all should, what we've been talking about, have this new perspective are you going to see that this new order is present that the kingdom is really the kingdom is really here so focusing on on that mission of the 12 but then carrying it forward that they are that that um that uh they are part of this they are part of this mission or part of this this reality to quote don jewel again of of god being loose in the world 
and how and how is that going to uh, how how is it that we are going to participate in that uh, in that unruly behavior of God? And that should blow your mind. I love that line, Ralph. Thanks. Um, we only defined a couple of your words there, Rolf. Well, you know what? We're, we're at about 15 minutes on one verse. Uh, I think we should probably move on. But it, uh, thank you guys for uh, uh, humoring me. Because uh, uh, I think we're going to come back to that verse the next few weeks. I have... Um, okay, I don't want to say anything bad about the lectionary uh, choices. But <laughs> I do want to warn that Jonah... Three is not necessarily um, an image of what it looks like to do Mark 115. That is, you know, uh, Jonah gets and preaches the worst sermon in the history of sermons. I, I, I assume, Joy and Carolyn, when you teach preaching, you say, want a bad sermon? Here's a bad sermon. 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown or Nineveh shall be no more. Something like five words in Hebrew, I can't remember. And then... Oh, so they all repented. Uh, even the cows, you know. So <laughs> I think this is a case, by the way, this is one of these cases, if you're going to preach Jonah, and why not do it if you don't want to stay in Mark for a few weeks, you got to tell the whole story because people don't know enough of the story to drop down in chapter three out of four chapters. So you really just got to take time, tell the whole story. Um, and this is the... This is the unbelievable part of the book of Jonah, by the way, not, not Jonah surviving in the big fish. It's that Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian empire, if you want to read what Nineveh was like, read the book of Nahum. Uh, Do I have to? Nope, but because okay. uh, you already know uh, what incredibly violent um, death dealing empire that was, right? And the idea that Nineveh repented because of a, a, a bad sermon from, that doesn't even name God, right? 40 days and Nineveh shall be no more. And the whole city repented, including the emperor. <laughs> it's a funny story. It's a funny story. And uh, it also is a hopeful story if we tie that into what we were just discussing uh, about the gospel uh, of Mark. Um, uh, Jonah didn't want to do this. He didn't want to see God, uh, God do, uh, uh, offer grace to these people. I mean, don't some of us have that attitude about some of us right now? And yet, without uh, energy, without passion, just barely out of obedience. Um, okay, this is really what God is about. I wish God weren't. Uh, which says more about Jonah, about me, than it does about God. But this is the good news. Whether I want to proclaim it or not, whether I want it to work on you or not, and then get out of the way and let the Spirit do what the Spirit can do. And that is the incredible nature, as you said, Ralph, of this text. And some preachers need to be reminded of that right now. And some congregations need to be reminded about that right now. And taking that again of uh, back to our having experienced the grace of God is not for us, but it is for us to be that witness in the world. Sorry, Jonah, God is calling you. Put your own name in there. Really important, Joy, that, I mean, to talk about the hope built into this. And so th this is where this passage, I think, is kind of an interesting complement to Mark 1. We didn't talk about fishing for people earlier, but that's some, some pastors or some preachers are going to follow that detail of Mark 1, which sounds a little scary, which sounds a little difficult, which sounds a little even forceful or violent or... or um, imposing in some in some settings as well but then you've got Jonah and if you if you pull people into the fable or the, to the myth of this and say this is supposed to be a delightful story that's going to make people laugh it's going to provide courage and some joy when there is no more of those to be found um we get that it's slightly unrealistic we get that it's is problematic in some ways. Uh, I, I talk about this a lot when I teach Acts. You can't preach Acts every single Sunday, but every now and then you need a story like that that's full of spectacle. 
to revive hope, to, to, to say maybe our expectations are a little bit too low for what God can do. And so if that's the direction you're going to preach with Mark 1, trying to you know, rally the, uh, the congregation in particular ways or to get excited or, or to uh, lift their heads, then um, Jonah might be an interesting, um, um, well, might be an interesting component of such a sermon. I just I think, figured out the link. So did I. It's fishers for people, and then Jonah is in a big fish. So see, there's the lectionary link right there. Oh, I did well, not catch that before. <laughs> wow. I know what I would preach on. Actually, I think the, uh, the link for this moment <laughs> is that the overall, I think the overall message of the story of Jonah is that God loves the people you hate. Amen. And so it, it ends with, you know, do you, are you mad that that plant died? Yes, mad enough to die. Well, um, you love the plant? Yeah. Well, I love Nineveh. Shouldn't I love Nineveh, God says. And then it ends on a question asking the reader. So a playful story ends actually by making the audience really angry, I think. The audience said it hates Nineveh. And so this is the story for you. If, 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 math, if Mark 1 is a call to action, maybe it's a call to action to quit hating people. The people you hate. Uh, last week we had an inauguration. Uh, okay, we're recording this right before the inauguration, uh, but let's assume it went off. Uh, but a lot of people I know hate a lot of people right now in the United States and other places in the world. And uh, maybe the message here is, you know, God loves the people you hate, and the call to action is to learn to love those people. And, yeah, oh, wow, I can't even say anything. That's great. All right, Psalm 62. Rock, fortress, rock, refuge, refuge. I wish there were fish in it. I'm going to start. I'm going to Fish start. like to hide in the rocks, Caroline. <laughs> or so I've been told. There's water in them, they're rocks. <laughs> um, yeah, you don't fish, do you? Me? No, I, I, Matt. I do gosh, not no. fish. No, it, I find it incredibly boring. Don't I send me an email. Go ahead, I, I'm, I'm Send me emails because I love to fish and I'll come out and fish with you. I'm with Matt, I don't fish. Oh, well. I like to eat fish though. Oh, yes, I will admit that. <laughs> Somebody else catch it for me. I will catch it. <laughs> Um, uh, this um, this opening line again, uh, and and leaning uh, uh, or, or pulling through what you were saying, Rolf, about uh, what can be preached in this. Um, another uh, tag for me is that that this is the moment. Now is a moment to use the word Matt used. Enough is enough. And so the question that this uh, uh, arises for me in Psalm is: For what are we waiting? I mean, we've been in this season of waiting, waiting to get out of our houses, waiting to get the vac the vaccine, waiting to have uh, the world change. What, you know, we've we've been in this season, but what are we waiting? Because in that list I just gave, I did not say what the psalmist said they were waiting for. For God alone, and then why? because God is our hope. God is uh, our steadfast rock. Uh, God is uh, the one who brings healing. I, 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 I just, um, I'm, I'm drawn into what moment is this uh, as I look at this Psalm. I appreciated the commentary, uh, the commentary invitation by Shauna Hannon uh, that uh, of mirroring the form of the Psalm uh, would you consider opening this sermon with your own expression of trust in God that has arisen out of an experience of crisis? Uh, or that we, that, that we invite the congregation into uh, a communal expression of trust uh, that God, that uh, of trust in God that has arisen in these, as you were saying, Joy, in these, in in this last almost year now of uh, pandemic politics and, and protest. And so uh, I think that would be one way to, to access the power of this Psalm 
is to uh, to model the form and invite people into that actual expression of trust. You know, verses one and two of the psalm, which are left out uh, inexplicably, then are also verses five and six. So you have this refrain. Uh, it starts the psalm, so that happens twice. And you you know the power of when uh, re of repetition in poetry. Um, you could use this as the part of the prayers of the people, right? Instead of, you know, instead of saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for God alone, my soul in silence waits, my hope is in him, or, you know, go on all the way through verse six. Um, Matt, uh, Matt started off, I think a little bit sarcastically about a uh, shocker from Matt, right? About some of the, the, the uh, very familiar language of uh, for God, rock, fortress, refuge. Jerome Creech uh, from Pittsburgh Seminary has written that refuge is the, the idea of God as refuge is the theological center of the book of Psalms. And um, his, the point is, is um, a strong point, uh, the idea of God as a refuge in, uh, to whom we can flee in the midst of uncertainty and terror. So I also love the ending. Once God has spoken, twice I've heard this, which is a Semitic way of speaking uh, where you it's always one or two and then or five and six or three or four. And it emphasizes um, that what comes next, power belongs to God. And what kind of power is this? It's steadfast love. But Matt just wanted to bring the, us back to First Corinthians. Just for the record, I was not speaking sarcastically. I was just summarizing the psalm. But I think I have one of those voices and faces where people think I'm always being sarcastic until they always want to punch me. So anyway. The, I've never um, wanted to punch you. and um, But I do, I'm do. i dying to hear what you have to say to connect First Corinthians 7 back to Mark 1. Well, I think a lot of preachers are going to scoff. We just have three verses here and they're very problematic even to read out loud and not comment. You know, even those who have wives be as those who, as though they had not. I mean, it just, it calls out for commentary in so many ways. And so it's a hard passage. You, you set it in context. Verses 21 through 24 are about slave, enslaved people saying, yeah, if you're enslaved, don't try to seek your freedom, you know, and then 25 through 28 are about marriage. And this is where we realized that Paul was no romantic. And you think, why would anybody ever quote from Paul at a wedding? Um, so these verses are so out of context, but they get at something that is so vital for understanding Paul. And I think also for understanding Jesus, which is this, this eschatological urgency, right? This notion of the appointed time having grown short and we have to ask the question, how does somebody live when they really believe that the present form of this world is passing away? Like, what does that look like? How is that part of maybe Jesus' own worldview and certainly Paul's own worldview? But to also confess the way it's not ours in a lot of ways, maybe it should be. But how, And the, the commentary by Melanie Howard is excellent on this, right? How do we live 2,000 years later with such um, apocalyptic themes and convictions running through our biblical texts, not something we want to get away from, but something we want to recover in a responsible way for, uh, for a credible 21st century Christianity that's not just ethical scolding or a, or, or a particular political agenda with some theological language attached to it. So it gets to the question, I think, and Joy has mentioned this, what are you hoping for? You mentioned this with with Joni, you mentioned this with the Psalm. What are you expecting God to do next? That's really a different question than what does a just world look like to you? They're related questions, but I worry that enough, too many in the church haven't, have, have kind of given up on that theological dimension of this. Not that Paul has the answer for us here in these verses, but if these verses don't put the problem in front of us really starkly, I can't find three verses that do that better. So I just want preachers to maybe to, to reflect on that a little bit. Um, if you're preaching on this, invite congregations into it. They're smart. They get it. They recognize that the institutions Paul is looking at, the lives Paul is looking at, he might have looked at very differently had he known he would be writing to 21st century Christians. So sorry, I'm going on a 
little miniature lecture here, but I just want to, <clears throat> excuse me, raise the question for, for our consideration and for our listeners. Two lines out of uh, the commentary uh, that uh, I, I'm going to highlight uh, because I, I really like what you're saying there, Matt, and that is one, um, the, the call to pursue a radical reorganization of their priorities and perceptions of the current reality. If we do not now need a radical reorientation of our priorities and our perceptions. And then the other is um, just this context setting, which you note that uh, in the previous verses, Paul has described all of these situations and then completely undoes everything that he is saying by pointing out the impending crisis, the fulfilled moment. Enough is enough. The time is now. Um, and I see that link uh, as, as you introduced to us at the beginning. Uh, and reading this verse for that immediacy and in the immediacy of our 21st century moment, I think is critical for uh, the voice that we give to, the, uh, to our congregations right now. 